I've returned to TAG once again to talk about the Palace Boy project. Um, this, this session gives me an opportunity to dissect my involvement in the project over the last four years in terms of my artistic influence and my independent artistic output, or the lack of it. Um, how do I click here? Um, yeah. um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Palace Boy project, it was initiated in 2014 by Dr. Benjamin Geary, who's sitting over there. Um, and quoting from our blurb, it set out to explore the creative process involved in the crafting of prehistoric wooden artifacts beginning in, with the Palace Boy vessel, an Iron Age wooden artifact discovered in 2000 in Torbog, County Westmeath. Palace Boy is the name of the townland, by the way, if anybody's wondering. Uh, experimental archaeology can tell us what materials and tools were used to craft prehistoric wooden artifacts, but little is known of the experience or process of crafting such objects. Using a detailed and thorough recording strategy, this project will reveal and document a contemporary experience of craft and in doing so provide new perspectives on an ancient creative process. So that's the project in a nutshell. Um, the current team lineup from left to right, we have Mark Griffiths, a woodworker, um, Orla Peach Power, a digital humanist, and she calls herself a recovering archaeologist. Um, myself, um, I'm an arts administrator, I'm an occasional artist and photographer, and also um, a recovering archaeologist. Um, ben, uh, Dr. Ben Benjamin Geary, um, is an environmental archaeologist, and he's based at UCC, where he lectures. That's University College Corp, sorry for the... Um, we started um, in 2015, technically, um, with the Palace Boy vessel, seen here in situ on the top left, and then moved on to anthropomorphic figurines, mostly dating to the Middle Bronze Age and Late Iron Age, uh, represented here by the Red Man of Kilbeg, which was excavated in County Offaly. Um, we are now in Phase 3, um, which is focusing on prehistoric watercraft, primarily the Lee Island 5 Iron Age log boat, which still lies at the bottom of Loch Harald in County Galway. There are many aspects of our project that warrant different presentations, and there have been many uh, given already. Um, given the time restriction, I will stick to the specifics of our session. Um, I don't think the Palace Boy project um, was intended as an experiment in art archaeology. I think it was more an experiment in experimental archaeology, using a more freeform approach and applying a different focus, less about how they did it in prehistory and more about what it was like, what were they thinking about, and whether we would experience anything similar if we tried it in a contemporary context. Yes, we would try using prehistoric methods, but not throughout. In a true contemporary context, nobody has that kind of time. In our case, the replica prehistoric tools were, uh, they reproved well-known points, like things were a lot harder in the old days and they took longer. <laughs> Um, but more importantly for us, the replica tools provided us with um, us and workshop participants first-hand experience of using the tools. It was intended that my role would be primarily concerned with documenting and recording in the form of photography and video and subsequent online dissemination via our blog and social media. Initially, Ben and I were excited about the potential for artistic responses to the project, but in the end, we both failed to include any such elements in our initial or subsequent funding proposals. At TAG 2015, I presented a joint paper with Ben about the first year of the project, and at the end, during the discussion, I raised um, concerns about the lack of planning and forethought regarding the artistic outputs. Perhaps, like most people, we subconsciously considered art to be a luxury, an extra, a bonus, and felt our funders would feel the same, so we didn't want them to pay for it on top of everything else. When including a clearly identified art strand have jeopardized our funding applications. After three years of successful funding applications and our fourth one being denied, we may never know. But um, in my conclusion, I'll talk about what might have been. Um, the subject of what is needed to have a successful collaboration between an archaeologist and an artist has been well covered in archaeological discourse by contributors such as Colin Renfrew, Renfrew Ian Russell, Andrew Cochran, and many more. Contemporary art is rife with archaeological processes and reference points. I won't attempt to squeeze in an overview here. Was the Palace Boy project set up to facilitate art archaeology collaboration? In theory, yes. Firstly, there was an openness on the part of the archaeologists to engage with artistic practice and process. 
In 2014, when I had approached the archaeology department at UCC about a project I was doing for my master's in art and process, Ben's was one of two responses, positive responses I received. One of Ben's colleagues was accommodating and also connected me with a PhD student. That's Sarah, not there in the top left, by the way, just a random, random occurrence. Um, would have, um, in the context of this session, what is most relevant about my approaches and the responses that followed was this. Ben actively and genuinely wanted to engage with me as an artist, and he was open to any potential outputs. The others, although kindly accommodating and tolerant, were primarily just that. It was clear from our initial conversations, um, excuse me, it was clear from our initial conversations that Ben was already engaged with interdisciplinary approaches to archaeology. I detected that some of his enthusiasm was drawn from his frustrations with closed, mi closed minds in his discipline, maybe even his, in his department. Um, he seemed keen to ruffle feathers, surprise peers, throw caution to the wind, and to allow projects and collaborative relationships to develop in a rhizomatic fashion. I don't use the term rhizomatic lightly. It is a favourite term of Ben's on the, in the context of our project. In botany, a rhizome is a, is a modified subterranean plant stem that sends out roosts and shoots from its nodes in almost any direction. The term rhizomatic in a philosophical context was developed by Gilles Deleuze and F Felix Guattari and is used to describe theory and research that allows for multiple non-hierarchical entry and exit points in data representation and interpretation. So is Ben's preferred approach for things to be rhizomatic rather than predetermined? He clearly relished random connections and happenings on the, as the project progressed. This openness to spontaneity and chance on the part of the archaeologist is arguably a very good starting point for an artist wishing to engage in an archaeological project. So in terms of the team assembled and the roles assigned, was there a potential for me to make art? Ben, our team leader, a specialist in environmental archaeology, focused on the source, content, funding applications, networking, academic dis dis dissemination, and some social media. He was not tied to being present for the full duration of crafting. He could come and go as he pleased. Orla, our second archaeologist, primarily carried out laser scans after crafting were relevant, and as such could come and go. Orla also contributed in the form of academic dis dissemination and social media. Mark, our woodworker, was completely tied to crafting for the duration and not free to come and go. He provided specialist analysis, insights, and expertise. Um, Sorry, I've lost my place. Um, and ex expressive documentation in diary form and almost all the physical graft, although we occasionally helped out. Um, as I was set the task of documenting everything that Mark was doing with photography, video, and sound, I was completely tied to crafting for the duration in that a representative record was needed throughout. I also contributed in the form of blog and social media management and some logistics. So in truth, the only art component truly intended in our roles was the artistic influence on the record, more specifically my artistic and photographic eye. With the focus on episodes of crafting and planning for same, there was a lot of small, uh, there was a lot of email exchanges, some lunchtime meetings between Ben and I, and then instant intense flurries of activity on site for crafting. Given the nature of my role, any independent art, art output would have to be generated off site and on my own time. My original intention was to develop parallel artistic outputs, but this ended up being more difficult than anticipated. I had other commitments, but the difficulties were also born out of my attempt attempting to occupy dual roles on the project, that of documentarian and artist. I found that I occupied very different headspaces when carrying out these roles and rarely did both happily, and um, when they overlapped, that is. So what did work? Um, to illustrate my so-called artistic influence, I'll quickly run through some images from the most recent phase, uh, phase three, um, dealing with the log boat. Um, I set out to find, find the individual oak that would um, be our dugout canoe. I looked a tree in the eye and came to terms with their special relationship, that of sacrificial spe specimen and executioner. This tree has been sentenced to death and with the possibility of an afterlife through woodcraft. The tree was presented and prepared um, for a craftsman who began his work. 
he benefited from some modern tools, um, but the task was going to be difficult. Um, oak is tough if you've ever tried to work it. Um, we submerged it in a pond in County Wicklow um, last December um, and then took it to the boatyard Matamara in Cork in April, um, where I struggled with lighting conditions and clutter. But basically, I, I would try to um, get the balance right between art artful representation and effective record. Um, I would document changing forms, textures, tool marks, whether prehistoric or modern, um, and use um, stronger lighting conditions to highlight the effects of the tools. Uh, there was the ubiquitous pictures of tools in action and tools at rest. Um, but I felt the most successful photographs were the ones that showed a process and the material in one. So what if I had engaged with the project just as an artist, not bounded by the recording responsibilities? What approach would I have taken? I've not fully completed a lot of art projects since I did my MA, but I would describe my process as follows. I start with an interest, a question, or an artistic inquiry, possibly some primary research. I gain, seek access to my subject by means of successful communication or formal proposal. I start with a strategy with further discussion an observation might take further requests or instruct, instruct where appropriate. I then begin to t make a record using my experience and technical skill and also improvising and using my intuition. I'm going to skip ahead a little here. Um, on the Palace Boy project, I, could switch this, I couldn't switch this part of me off given my primary role, um, so I inevitably hit on my artistic practice in patches. But there was some overlap. Um, so what was of interest to me? Um, from the outset, I was fascinated and inspired by the myths, legends and folklore associated with Alder and how the stories tied in with the material properties of the tree and its timber. Sorry, I should go back to that one. Yeah. Um, of particular interest was the blood red sap and associations with death. I was also taken with the lack of certainty regarding the original purpose of the vessel. And rather than finding the, this frustrating, I saw it as an opportunity to explore possibilities free from boring academic concerns like evidence. It was suggested that the Palace Boy vessel was used for bathing. Others suggested it, it was for cooking, making beer, um, or a water trough. This is one of two bathtubs in a field next to where the Palace Boy vessel was discovered. And there's the other one. Um, I liked the fact that this vessel, the bathtub, could have been used for a whole load of things, like bathing and keeping beer bottles cool at a party, anything. Um, and there's also a suggestion it was used as a cradle, even momentarily. I found these kind of uncertainties fascinating, and it was beginning to inform where I might go with my own artistic process. I also thought the vessel um, had its own voice, hearing how, how the sounds it made during the crafting. And so this led me to invite experimental percussionists to interact with the vessel, and they performed their own kind of sound christening ceremony. More recently, um, I had somebody play a replica Iron Age horn while somebody else played the vessel like a log drum. Um, I also embarked on an investigation of the use of the, the so-called waste from the project. And the plank you see in the top left there, um, I began to um, reduce down into more manageable components like you might find in a hardware store, lengths or planks or cubes. Um, but before that, I documented the surfaces and the story that the plank told of when it was dragged out of the wood by the tractor. And that's halfway through the process. Um, I actually stopped at that point and couldn't bring myself to finish it for about a year because um, I thought they had sculptural qualities. But then eventually this year, I followed through. And you see in the bottom right there are pieces that we use to make the drumsticks. I also um, whittled down some smaller objects into kind of pseudo artifacts, focusing on form and culture. Um, uh, form and texture, rather, and color, and making them look like they may have a use. I'm not quite finished with that. Um, I was also fascinated by the alchemy. Oops, sorry, that's me. Um, 
um, the alchemy of the process of the hafting process and um, where we made a binding agent. Um, we attempted to use the binding agent that we used in the prehistoric artifacts um, to make a substitute rubber for our drumsticks, which was a complete failure. Um, it was very brittle and it wasn't like rubber at all, so we ended up covering it in leather. And this is our percussionist looking very unconvinced. Um, so in conclusion, um, was it a good idea to recruit an RT former archaeologist to be responsible for the record of the project? Um, I hope so, um, and I hope my colleagues agree. Um, was the record compromised in any way by my approach? Possibly in an archaeology context, but given Ben and the project's rhizomatic and atypical approach, it is a given that all is forgiven. Um, were there alternatives? Yes, we could have used a professional photographer who would have taken um, may, may have been more likely to direct proceedings and be more expensive, or an archaeological photographer who might have prioritized information and neglected aesthetics. Um, was there scope for both the photographer and an artist? And if so, would the roles differ? Yes, um, I think we could have accommodated both, um, and the roles would, would have differed. Um, an, an undistracted and dedicated photographer, whatever their background or specialism, would have had enough to do. I was distracted by other commitments at times and also my artistic leanings. I wanted to skip my photographic responsibilities and pursue artistic tangents. In hindsight, and with more money in the pot, an artist could have been given the same time budget as the photographer, but allowed to spend that time as they wish. Uh, sometimes spending time on site during crafting, but also, also, but also pursuing the other leads, visiting different locations and developing ideas in the studio. Their time could be spread over a longer period, less intensive than the periods of crafting and recording. Although I've enjoyed my role as a photographer on the project, I would also like to have been that artist. And, but rather than harbour regrets, I, am, I aim to pursue some of the ideas in my own time and feedback into the project as it progresses. In some ways, being under no obligation to do so is somewhat liberating. Thank you. <laughs>